So we're, we're in the book of James. If you have your Bible with you, um, then I want you to open up to James chapter 1. If you don't have your Bible with you, then either listen along or if someone next to you has their Bible, you can kind of look on with them. Uh, but we're going to be uh, in James chapter 1, starting in verse 19 this morning, and we're going to get to that in just a second. You know, we've started going through the book of James, and one thing that I love about the book of James is he is so very practical in what faith should be. Because one of the biggest complaints I hear about people who uh, don't go to church, about people who say that they don't believe in God, one of the biggest things that that people like to point out is, well, the so-called Christians, their lives are no different than my life. You know, sure, they go to church on Sunday or, or maybe on Wednesday, but all throughout the rest of the week, their lives are not showing anything of what they claim to be. Now, should it be that way? No. Because if Christianity, if God's Word, if Jesus Christ makes no difference in our lives, then what in the world are we doing here? We're just wasting our time. And not only are we wasting our time today, but the millions and millions who have gone before us and the millions of other Christians around the world who meet on, on, on the Lord's Day, or, and some of them meet Saturdays, and some of them meet Tuesdays or Wednesdays you know, through, throughout the week, uh, then we're just wasting our, our time. So the question we need to be asking is, does faith in Christ, does Christianity, does God's Word, does it truly make a difference? And James, he was the brother of Jesus. He was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And all throughout the book of James, you see many times he, he addresses those that he writes as my brothers, my brothers. It was a common affectionate term because he was reminding them that, you know, as part of the church, we're part of the family. We're, we're part of the family. And he was concerned about the family throughout. They were scattered throughout the world because of persecution. So even though they were from distant places, they were still connected together, my brothers. And, th- and throughout the book of James, one of the things that we're going to see specifically today, but really we're going to see throughout the entire book, is this. If you have true faith, if you truly believe in God, then it should make a difference in your life. And if it doesn't make a difference well, then maybe you don't really have faith in in Jesus. Um, And so so a question that we should be asking ourselves is, if I claim to be a Christian, then how can I avoid becoming the type of person whose faith makes no difference in my life? How can I avoid being that type of person that people see, well, he goes to church, but other than that, I don't really see a difference in, in his life. How can we make sure that our lives do make a difference? And this is where, what we're going to be looking at this, this morning in James chapter 1, starting in verse 19. Let's read together. James chapter 1, starting in verse 19. And James, as he's writing, he says this. My dearly loved brothers, understand this. Everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For man's anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. Therefore, ridding yourselves of all moral filth and evil, humbly receive the implanted word which is able to save you. We'll look at uh, some of the following verses in in a little bit, but when we look at these first three verses here, um, how can I make sure that my life makes a difference? Well, what we need to do, the first thing that we need to do is to receive the word. We need to receive the word because words are powerful. Words make a difference. And in verse 19, James starts off with three commands. One is be quick to do something, and then the next two are be slow to do these. So be quick to what? Be quick to hear or be quick to listen. And then what's the next one? Be slow to speak. Now, how many of you have heard before, since we have two ears and one mouth, what should that mean? We should listen twice as much that we speak. You know, God gave us two ears. He gave us one. It's a good thing God didn't give us two mouths. For one, I'd argue with myself. Well, I already argue with myself all, all the time. But, uh, you know, it, it, it would just be out of control if, if each of us had more than one, one mouth. Because James knows that 
we as human beings, we like to run our mouths. I think of the disciple Peter. Peter was one who loved Jesus dearly, but he was also one whose mouth would go quickly away from him. And the thing when it comes to words is once you speak your words, can you ever take them back? No, once they are out, they are out. You might, as soon as they're out, you might be like, no, stop, and you try to get them back, but, but you can't. And so James says, so we need to be quick, not to speak, but quick to hear. And then slow to speak. But then there's also one more slow. Be slow to what? Be slow to anger. Be slow to, to get angry. Because James, he connected these, these two things. He connected anger and he connected words. Because oftentimes when a person is angry, it so easily comes out in words. Have any of you ever been angry and you just had to bite your tongue? I have. Because that's part of that human emotion. When we get angry, it just wants to come out through our words and then also through our actions. And so that's why when we get angry and, and we're filled with that, it's just hard to control it. It's hard to keep, to keep it back. Uh, because when, we just, when we're not careful with our words, when we're quick to speak, when we're quick to throw our words out, then our anger is just going to lash out, out, is, is just going to lash out there. So most people that you know, are most people that you know quick to listen or slow to listen? Slow to listen, right. Uh, FDR, the president, uh, he made mention one time that one thing that just always annoyed him is whenever people, when, when he was standing in line and people were, were coming through shaking his hand, which as a president you do a whole lot, he said, no one really pays attention, no one really hear, hears, no one really listens. And so there was one day that he decided to do an experiment. And as he was in that receiving line, and as people were coming by shaking his hand, uh, he would shake his hand, smile at them, and say, I killed my grandmother this morning. And most everyone's response was, well, that's wonderful. Well, have a good day. Well, keep up the good, good work. Well, the ambassador to, to Bolivia, he was kind of the last one in line. And I don't know if he kind of picked up on what was going on, or maybe he was just one who was not slow to listen. And so when FDR said, I killed my grandmother this morning, he leaned up to him and he said, well, I'm sure she deserved it. <laughs> you see, most people do not listen. And, and, and James, he, he says, all right, so we need to be quick to listen. And we need to be slow to speak. Because when we are quick to speak, our anger will take off with us. Because anger is hard to control. And if we don't control our mouths, we're not going to be able to control our anger. In fact, Proverbs chapter 17, verse 27, the writer of Proverbs says, The intelligent person restrains his words. And one who keeps a cool head is a man of understanding. So even the writer of Proverbs was linking anger and linking words together, much like James is doing here. Now, when he says this in verse 20, he mentions man's anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. Now, notice he didn't say anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. He says man's anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. Because there's two different angers. There's God's anger and there's man's anger. And there is a difference between them. In Psalm 86, verse 15, the psalmist says this, But you, Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and rich in faithful love and truth. When you read throughout the Bible, is there ever a time where God gets angry? Yes. When you read throughout the Bible, is there ever a time that God is controlled by his anger? where his anger is just out of control. Does God lash out like a spoiled child? No. In fact, there it says he is slow to anger. And when, for instance, when you're in the Old Testament and you're reading about the Israelites who, man, time and time again, just keep disobeying God. God, God saves them. He delivers them. God uh, uh, provides for them. Um, and yet they keep disobeying God. In fact, I think uh, 
on Wednesday's youth, I think you just finished the book of Judges, and that's really what the entire book of, uh, of Judges is about. And yet the Israelites keep turning away and turning away against God. And every time I read that, no matter how many times, I'm always amazed at God's patience. And really, I don't really have to go hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years back in history. I can just look at myself and how many times that I tend to be selfish and I tend to turn away from God and I tend not to be care- careful with my, with my words. And I am amazed at God's patience and at his grace. But God is a just God and God's anger is always directed at sin, is always directed at wickedness, and God never does wrong in his anger. And so there's a difference between God's anger and man's anger because man's anger is not patient. I mean, we can just think about fights we've had this week. If you fought with your parents or if you fought with your children or fought with your husband or wife or fought with a friend or maybe even fought with your, yourself, how quick we are to anger. And notice James says our anger does not accomplish God's purposes. It does not accomplish God's righteousness. After all, vengeance belongs to who? God. That's what the scripture says. Vengeance belongs to God. So why, does not man, why, why doesn't man's anger accomplish God's purposes? Because let me ask you this question. Usually, when you are, ang- when you are angry, who are you thinking about the most? Yourself or the person you're angry at? How often is it that our anger is really because we're concerned about God? There's times where we can be angry when the world is in rebellion about God. And there's times where we should be angry about the wickedness and sin and evil in the world. But face it, most of the times when we're angry, it's about us. It's, it's not about God. And so James says, so be slow to anger. Or, yeah, be slow to anger. Be slow to speak. Be quick to listen. Because your anger doesn't accomplish God's purposes. And then in verse 21, he says, So therefore, because of all this, rid yourselves of all moral filth and evil and humbly receive the implanted word. So there's a transplant that needs to take place. You know, words are important. They are powerful. Words can destroy life and words can give life. How many of you know the old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will what? Never hurt me. Words hurt, do they not? They do. That saying, that saying is not true. When you look at words, words are powerful. Because in the, be- in the beginning, in, in Genesis chapter 1, how did God create the world? He spoke it into existence. God said, let there be light. God said, let there be stars. God said, it was by God's word that life was created. And then when the world rebelled against God and brought sin and death and brokenness into the world, it was by God's word that that there is a new creation. Because as John tells us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And it goes on to say that the Word took on flesh and took up residence among us. And that Word, it's referring to Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Word of God. And by Jesus' life in death and resurrection, that there can be a new creation. In fact, the Bible goes on to say that when it comes to a person um, when it comes to a person having that new creation, when it comes to that person being saved, when it comes to that, that, that person receiving God's grace, it comes by faith. And faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So you see, words are so powerful. It can give life. It can save life. It can recreate new life but it can also tear down and destroy. And so when James in, in verse uh, there 21 says, rid yourselves of all moral filth and evil, yes, he's talking about anything that's wicked, but specifically he's talking about the evil and filth that can come from our mouths. Get rid of it. It's like taking off dirty clothes. You just take them off and, ca- and, and, cast, and cast them off. Rid yourself of these things. So rid yourself of these things and instead receive the saving implanted word. Receive the implanted word which is able to save you. Now that word implanted, 
is talking about far- farming. Any of you ever planted seeds before? Now, any of you plant seeds and nothing ever happens to them? You know, I do not have a green thumb. My grandmother, she can plant a dead stick and it will you know, become a, a whole forest. Um, but receive the implanted word. So when it comes to planting, what type of soil works and what type of soil does not work? You know, there's a parable that Jesus gave about a sower who was sowing seeds. And he listed four different types of of soil. There was a hard path that was so hard that the seed couldn't even sink in. Do you think that that seed became a plant? No. There was another uh, seed which um, it had shallow soil. And so even though it sprouted and, and, and there were roots, the roots weren't really deep. So when the sun came out, it scorched that plant. And did that plant bear fruit? No. And then there's another type of soil that uh, Jesus mentioned, and because there's the seed, uh, it, it, it started growing, and, and there were roots, but it was surrounded by weeds, and the weeds choked it. And did that plant bear fruit? No. But then there was the fourth type of soil, and that soil was good soil. It wasn't shallow. It wasn't hard it wasn't filled with, re- with, with weeds. And when that seed took root, it bore fruit. And so when it comes to our lives, if, J- if James is telling us to receive God's implanted word, if our heart is hard, will we be able to really receive it? If our heart is choked by the things in this world that can distract us, and fill up our lives, whether it's things from comfort and convenience to our own concern for our pride and reputations to um, people who pull us down, will we really be able to receive God's Word? And what about if we're so concerned with the cares of this world that we're so scared with well, how am I going to get by today? What am I going to do? We're, we're just filled with fear and just filled with concerns and questions. Will we really be able to receive God's word? And so when James says, so receive the implanted word, that means our hearts have to be ready to receive God's word. And, and what does it mean to be ready? Well, James says, humbly receive the implanted word. Humbly, that means we come before God with our hearts saying, God, I need you. I need your word. I recognize that your word is good, that your word is my authority. And so do we receive the saving word of God because we need to transplant our words with God's word? That's why in Romans chapter 13, verse 14, it says, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no plans to satisfy the fleshly desires. So when it comes to the words that are so quick to speak and so quick with anger, we need to cast those off like filthy garments and put on the word, Jesus Christ, onto our, onto our lives. So if I want to be a person where my life, my faith, makes a difference in my life, I have to receive the word. Because if I don't receive the word, then it will make no difference in my life because it won't even penetrate my heart. It won't, it won't bear fruit. James continues on in verse 22. Look there, and he says this. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man looking at his own face in a mirror. He looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but one who does good works, this person will be blessed in what he does. So not only do we need to receive the word, but secondly, we need to respond to the word. We need to respond to the word. Because what does James say? He says, just be a hearer of God's word? No, he says, be a doer of God's word and not a hearer only. Because to truly receive God's word is more than just hearing it. It's more than just reading it. It's about doing it. Because we deceive ourselves if we think hearing it is good enough. 
because if hearing it or reading it was good enough, then let me tell you this. Southern Baptists in North America should have transformed and saved this whole world by now. Because if there's one thing that we're good at, it's about hearing sermons, listening to sermons, doing Bible studies. And if hearing and listening and reading is, it would be enough, then this world would look so much different than it is. But James says, uh-uh, you're deceiving yourselves if you think that's enough. Which means this. If I think, all right, I read my Bible, I go to church, I even go to Sunday school, I even pay attention and I listen, I might even take notes, man, I'm a good Christian. And James says, you are lying to yourself. That convicts me. Because James says, "Uh uh-uh, that's not what it's about. Be a doer of God's word. In Romans chapter 2, verse 13, Paul said, For the hearers of the law are not righteous before God, but the doers of the law will be declared righteous. If our church, and not just our local church, but yes, our church here and the church nationwide were filled with those who did God's Word, it would make a phenomenal difference in this world. But unfortunately, we're too often filled, myself included, with us who think that hearing is good enough. And then James talks about a mirror. How many of you have looked in a mirror today? You know, in the time in the world where James is writing, not everyone had a mirror in their bathroom. Besides, um, I I don't remember exactly when indoor plumbing was invented. Does anybody know that that date? Tommy? (laughs) Uh, It was a happy day. All right, all right. And And so mirrors were not... Uh, and, and also, they didn't have mirrors as we, as we know them. Mirrors in the, in, in the biblical world uh, were usually made of polished metal. Uh, because, you know, you, you've seen metal. If it's, if it's nice and shiny, you can see your reflection. And that's still not quite the same as the reflections we have in, in mirrors today, but they didn't have the mirrors that we have. Um, and so, really, the most common person didn't have a mirror in their home. It was usually the rich who had a, bra- you know, a bronze mirror that was, like I said, that was buffed and, and shined to, to give a reflection. And so most people didn't have a mirror. Uh, so most people didn't look at the reflection every day. Sure, they might glance the reflection, you know, in water, or if they do happen to pass by a, a piece of, of metal that was enough to give, a, to give a reflection, they might see, you know, their reflection. Now, when it comes to looking at yourself in water, does that always give a great reflection of uh, of what your image is? No, not always. And what about, you know, metal? You know, even nice, shiny metal, does it always give a clear picture of your reflection? Well, no. And so, when James is talking about, you know, a, a mirror, keep this in mind. Most of us have a good idea of what we look like. And why is that? Well, because we're looking at mirrors all the time. But if you lived in a world where you didn't have mirrors as we do, and if you lived in a world where the only time you saw your reflection might be uh, in, in a stream or, or in water or in uh, kind of a dirty piece of metal, you wouldn't really have a great understanding of what you look, of what you look like. You know, even though we know what we look like, do we have a mirror that shows us spiritually what we look like? Because James says, he, he's talking about the one who hears the word and does not do it. He says he's like a man who looks at his own face in the mirror. He looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he is. Well, there are many people who are very confused on what they look like. And I'm not just talking about physically. I'm talking about spiritually. There are a lot of people that says, man, I am a good person. 
There are a lot of people that think all you need to be is a good person to get into heaven. And you know that's true. All it takes is to be a good person. But watch how I use the word good. I'm talking about one who is good with no evil or no wickedness in them. But the Bible tells us that no one is good except for God. But there's a lot of people that live around us that think, man, look at me. I'm doing great. And I'm not just talking about the lost world out there. I'm talking about so-called Christians. Man, look at me. I'm doing well. We need a mirror to help us to see what we truly look like. Have any of you ever had that embarrassing experience where you've had something on your face or maybe you didn't button your shirt the right way and because you didn't look at it, you, you didn't know until someone told you? No one wants to admit it. All right, well, let me turn it around. Have you ever known anyone that has done that? Yeah, now everyone can raise their hand. You don't want to admit it for, for yourself. Well, as if we call ourselves Christians, then we need something to help show us our heart, to help show us what we're doing well and what we're not doing well, to show us our weaknesses and, and what we need to change in our lives. Do you think there's a mirror that exists that does that? It's called God's Word. You see, the man who hears the Word only but does not do it, he is one who is like a man who looks in a mirror, and really the Greek word there is who glances in a mirror. So it's not even a strong look, just one, a quick glance. And he immediately goes away and he forgets what he looks like. You see, only glancing at God's word, his mirror that he gives us, does not really help us to know who we are. Does not help us to know the condition of our hearts. Because what good does it do to just give a quick glance in a mirror? Now, we who are used to what we look like, because we look at mirrors all the time, well, if we do a quick glance, it doesn't seem any harm. But if you lived in a day where there were no mirrors and all you did was a quick glance, how well would you remember? Because how good does a quick glance do? You recently got your driver's license, which is a scary thing. But when you're, when you're in driver's ed, when you are approaching a stop sign or approaching an intersection, what are you taught to do? To look both ways. Now, let me, let, let me ask everyone a question. If in driving, if coming up to an intersection, if everyone only just did a quick glance, would that cause more or less accidents? More. And so when it, comes to God, when it comes to God's word, if we only give a quick glance, how good does it really do? It does us no good only just to glance. Because God's word is that mirror which helps us to know where our lives are at, that helps us to know... How our lives making a difference. It helps us know, God, what's good in my life and what can I strengthen in my life? What's wrong in my life and needs to be removed in, in my life? And if all we do is just glance at it, then it is doing us no good. It is useless. Not because this is useless, but because we are not making use of it. It's like if you had a mirror in your house and you never looked at it. What would be the point well, if you have God's word in your house and you never look at it, or if you just look glancing at it, then what is the point? But James goes on and says, But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but one who does good works, this person will be blessed in what he does. There's an old logo that it's probably not as popular anymore, but go ahead and show the, put the first picture on the screen. Raise your hand if you know what that is a logo of. All right, there's a few hands. All right, just someone shout it out. RCA Victor. RCA Victor of a dog staring into a gramophone. All right, go ahead and put the next picture. Here's another logo. RCA, and there's times where if you look up the old logo, it has under that dog looking at the gramophone, his master's voice. 
You see, RCA Victor, the company, they, they took this image of a dog staring at a gramophone from a painting. And the, uh, the person who made that painting, Francis Berard, Berard uh, he had a brother, and his brother owned a dog named Nipper. I've never known a dog named Nipper, but that was his name. And his brother also owned a gramophone that he recorded his voice on. You know, we're used to recording our voices all the time, but for the world that had never known that before, you know, just the wonder and the coolness and, you know, how unbelievable it was. Well, there was a time where Francis Berard, his brother, passed away, and he gave him his dog, and he gave him his gramophone and all his recordings. And Berard, he discovered that any time he put on one of the recordings of his brother speaking, that dog Nipper would go and sit and just stare at the gramophone because it heard his master's voice. You know, Jesus is not physically on this earth anymore. But we still have his word with us. And when it comes to his word that he's given us, whether in reading it or whether in hearing it, how do we respond to it? Is it like that dog that longs to be with his master again and listens intently to that voice? Sure, I know the dog didn't know what those words were saying, but the dog knew that this is my master. So how do we approach God's word? Like the man who intently looks into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it. You see, we can either approach God's word intently or casually. And when it comes to listening or when it comes to reading God's word, what good does it do just to throw the scripture open? All right, I'll read some verses because that's what I'm supposed to do. All right, I'm done reading the verses. I'll close the Bible and I'll go on throughout my day. Or instead, like Nipper sitting in front of that gramophone, do we approach God's word, eager to hear, even if we don't understand all the words, looking intently, trying to figure out what our master is saying? Because James says that the one who approaches God's word correctly is the one who approaches it intently and perseveres in it. You need, not only do we need to intently approach God's Word, but we need to persevere in it. All too often, we as Christians, we don't come to God's Word and persevere in it. We come to God's Word periodically. When I was a youth, one of my biggest frustrations is, man, there were times where, all right, I'm going to do my quiet time. And I would go strong for two days and then would go a couple weeks. And then, all right, I'm going, to, I'm going to get in God's Word, and I'd go strong for a day, and then go a few weeks. And, you know, what good does it do for us to be in God's Word and then go for a long period without, to be in, to be out, to be in, to be out? Because how can God's Word change us if we're not in it? Because until you get rooted in God's Word, His Word will not get rooted in you. And notice what it says about God's Word. It is the perfect law of freedom, as it says in verse 25. And in verse 21, it mentioned that His Word is able to save you. And so I'm not talking about just studying words and getting more knowledgeable. I'm talking about His Word, which frees us and which saves us. Which frees us from what? Well, from sin and from brokenness from despair and depression, from selfishness and pride, from bitterness and anger. In, chap in Luke chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus said, Even more those who hear the word of God and keep it are blessed. Because you see, when we respond to the word and when we follow the word, it does bring freedom into our lives. But so often people think that God's word is not about freedom, it's about restriction. Do this, don't do this. Well, God's word is just about limiting what I want to do. 
You know, that's the same exact lie and deception that Satan played on Eve in the Garden of Eden. Because when God created Adam and Eve, he created them in a world that was beautiful and perfect. And he gave them freedom to walk with him, to know him, to be in a relationship with him, to enjoy the creation. God just gave one law, and what was that? Don't eat from this tree here. Everything else is yours. Youth, how many of you would like to have just one rule and that's it? Adam and Eve just had one rule. Well, Satan came around and he started talking to Eve. He was in the form of a servant. And, um, and, he, and, and they started talking about the fruit of that tree. And Satan said, well, did God really say that if you eat it, you'll die? So he was having Eve starting to doubt God's word. And she said, yes, if we touch it or eat it, we'll die. And then this is what Satan said, you will not die. In fact, you will become like God. Because Satan wanted Eve to think, God is limiting you. He's holding you back. He's restricting you. And all you have to do is do that one thing that God says don't do, and you'll find freedom because you'll become like God. And so in disobeying God's word, did Adam and Eve find freedom? They found death. And so often we think God's word is about just do this and don't do this, and it's not about... But the truth is when we follow God's word, it's, it's not about restricting us, it's about freeing us. Freeing us to be the men and the women that he created us to be. Freeing us to be able to have a relationship with him. Freeing us to be able to have e- 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 eternal life. And so do we want to be like that person who just casually comes to God's word periodically that just glances at it? Or do we find it as a treasured possession, something that can free us and save us, something that can change our lives and change the lives of those that are around us? Because there is blessing in the freedom that God's word brings from sin and from brokenness and from death. And so this morning, do you really receive God's word? And do you respond to God's word? But James isn't done yet in verse 26 and 27. He finishes this passage by saying this. If anyone thinks he is religious without controlling his tongue, then his religion is useless and he deceives himself. Pure and undefiled religion before our God and Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. If anyone thinks his religi- he is religious without controlling his tongue, then his religion is useless and he deceives himself see what james is getting at is not only do we need to receive and respond to god's word but we need to reveal the word we need to reveal the word two questions with that first of all is god's word revealed in your words James, he's talking about words, he's talking about the tongue, and later on in the book he's going to continue talking about the tongue. So why are words and why is the tongue so important to James? Remember, James was the brother of Jesus. And even though when Jesus was alive on the earth, James did not believe that he was the Messiah, that he was God's son, but after Jesus was resurrected, that's when James believed. And James soaked in all the words that Jesus said. And so much of what he writes here in James reflects a lot of what Jesus himself spoke and taught. For instance, Jesus said this in Luke chapter 6, verse 45. A good man produces good out of the good storeroom of his heart. An evil man produces evil out of the evil storeroom. For his mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. So why are words and why is the tongue so important to James? Because... The tongue speaks what comes from the heart. An untransformed tongue points to an untransformed heart. And if a person claims to be religious and their life and their heart is not transformed, then their religion is useless. In Matthew 7, 21 Jesus mentioned that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, 
but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. There are a lot of people who call themselves Christians. They've said a prayer. They've walked an aisle. They've been baptized. They go to church. They carry their Bible. They do Bible studies. But when they die and appear before Jesus, Jesus will say, I don't know you. Depart from me. They'll say, Lord, Lord. Is God's word revealed in your words, but is his word revealed in your actions? Because James then gives a definition of what true, pure, undefiled religion is. And notice this. It's nothing about religious ceremonies. It's nothing about church or baptism or Bible study. What is it? It's looking after orphans and widows in their distress and keeping oneself unstained by the world. Does anybody remember the two greatest commandments? The first one is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second one is to love your neighbor as yourself. And we see those two here. Because if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength, then you will keep yourself unstained by the world. Because God tells us that we are not to love the world or anything of the world. Because if we love the world, then the Father is not in us. And if we love the world more than the Father, then we're going to be stained by the world. You know, earlier James was talking about a mirror, and God's Word is a mirror for our hearts, but we are also supposed to be a mirror to the world of who Christ is. And if we are stained by the world, and if we look no different than the world, then how can the world truly see who Jesus is? But if we love God with everything, and if His Word transforms our hearts, then we're going to reveal Him to the world because we're not stained by the world. But not only are we to love God with everything, we're also supposed to love our neighbor as ourself. And so James says, so if you want to know what pure and undefiled religion looks like, it's taking care of orphans and widows. Orphans and widows were the two most vulnerable people in, in their society. They had no rights. They had no means of providing for themselves. If there was not someone within the Jewish society who took care of an orphan or a widow, then they would starve and die. They had no way to take care of themselves. And all throughout God's Word, God told them time and time again to look after those who are the least of these to look after those who are vulnerable, to look after those who are in distress. Because after all, when Jesus came, he came to seek and to save the lost. He came to look and find those who could not save themselves. And if God's word is truly within us, then won't we follow his word? And if we truly receive and respond to God's word, then it's going to be revealed by how we treat others. It's going to be revealed by what we reflect to the world. So is God's word revealed in your life? When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with them, he will sit on the throne of his glory, and the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate them one from another, just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right, and he will put the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on the right, Come in, you who are blessed by my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you since the foundations of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick and, sick and you took care of me. I was a prisoner and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? 
When did we see you a stranger and take you in or without clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, I assure you, whatever you did for the least of these, you also did for me. And then the king will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. By the way, that tells us what the purpose of hell is. Hell exists for the devil and his fallen angels. God did not create hell for people, but for those who choose not to follow God or believe in him. Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in. I was naked and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you didn't take care of me. Then they too will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or without clothes or sick in prison and not help you? Then he will answer them, I assure you, whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. In just a minute, we're going to respond to God's word. And I pray that there is no one here who is so deceived that they think that they're going to be going into heaven. And in the end, they'll hear, depart from me. Because if we have truly accepted God's word in our heart, and if we have truly believed in the word in Jesus Christ, then it makes a difference in our life. That's what James is talking about. If we call ourselves a Christians, it doesn't mean we're going to be perfect, but it means that our lives will be reflecting Christ. It means that our lives will be demonstrating him through our actions and through our words. And if he makes no difference in my life, then I don't know him. And there might be a person here today that, sure, you've said a prayer, you've walked an aisle, you've been baptized, but if there has been no change in your life, then do you really know him? You have an opportunity to. Don't let it pass away and you just get to heaven and say, well, God, I said a prayer. I was baptized. I did the religious things. Because without a relationship with Jesus, there is no eternal life. And a relationship with Jesus will change our lives and bear fruit. And so this morning, receive and respond to God's word. For one of you here, that might mean salvation for the first time, a relationship with Jesus. To turn from yourself and your sins and say, Jesus, I do believe in you, that you died for me, and I want to give my life to you, not just in words or in actions, but truly to surrender everything, to give you my heart. And if you have not done that, And today you have an opportunity to. Fellow Christian, how will you receive and respond to God's word today? Maybe it might be in responding to his word in in obedience. Because your life has not been reflecting him to the world around you. Maybe today you need to come and to rededicate your life. Maybe you need to come today and say, it's time for me to be baptized. I have accepted Christ, but I've never followed obediently in being baptized. Maybe today what it means to be obedient to God is to join, is to joining this local fellowship of believers. Maybe in being obedient to God means to come and to give up that thing that you are worshiping more than God. To give up that thing that is robbing your life. To give up that addiction, to give up that friend to give up that anger, to give up that bitterness. Maybe you need to come and by receiving and responding to the word, it's time that your life will reveal his word through you to those around him. So after we pray, how will you respond? Father God, we come before you and Father, we thank you that you have given us your word. 
that frees and saves. Father, I pray if there is one this morning here who does not know you, God, that they will enter into that new life and that new relationship. God, I pray that you would reveal to each one of us here what we need to do to truly receive your word, to respond to it, so that you are revealed through our lives. Father, may we come and may we respond obediently. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.